everyone. This is Diana Bolander with the Rye West Art Museum, and welcome to one of our curators, Joe and Tells. We've got a special guest tonight. Our director, Greg Gavadney, is going to talk to us about the furniture in the Rar parlor. So I'm going to turn it over to him. If you have any questions as we go through, you can um, put them into the chat boxes, and I can relay them to Greg. Um, so, Greg, here you go. Thank you so much, Diana. Uh, and thank you for letting me uh, jump into a, a curator's show and tell. Uh, I'm in the Vilas Rar Mansion, uh, part of the Rar West Art Museum, and uh, I'm currently in the Rar Parlor. And if you visit the Rar West, you know that uh, out of out of everything in the historic Vilas Rar Mansion, most of the rooms you're allowed to walk into, and, and it's not really um, there aren't any historic settings in the rooms. There might be some small furnish, furnishing, some decorative arts, but um, outside of really this room, we don't really block off anything else. We do block off this room because this room is actually furnished with some of the furnishings that the, uh, that the Rar family owned when they lived here and uh, the furniture that they had in this parlor. Um, I am in here, we're, we, we're, we've uh, taken the ropes down and I get to be in here to give you a little bit of insight into the furniture, the furniture styles, Victorian settings in general. Uh, and uh, I wanna have a lot of fun with this. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about the background, but first, if you are tuning in, make sure that you make a comment, leave a comment, leave a notice, let us know that you're here. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, Diana's with me the whole time. She'll be relaying any messages you have so that I can uh, answer them. Uh, she'll also relay any corrections you have if I get my information wrong. So uh, I'm looking for uh, all of you furniture experts out there to help me out tonight. Um, one thing about this, uh, this room that, that has always intrigued me is that it is, in fact, one of the only places in our particular museum where you have the historic furnishings, where you have the stuff that was in this place before it became a museum. And that, that's intriguing to me as a historian and as a museum professional. Um, we're going to get into the detail of this furniture, but I want to talk a little bit about uh, why this particular uh, event came about. Uh, what happened was, at the end of uh, 2020, um, we were working on our uh, community portrait project. That's uh, a project that we have ongoing. For many of you in our community, you know we have uh, the, uh, the work of uh, Sonia uh, Vasquez, a uh, great portrait artist in our community who is uh, doing portraits of all different people from all different backgrounds here at Manitowoc. We also invite you to take part by uh, grabbing a packet. Uh, you can pick it up at the Rar West Art Museum, even though we're not open yet to the public. You can drive by, and then after this weekend, we're going to be reopening, so you'll be able to come by and actually pick up a kit. Do one of those self-portraits. Uh, we ask, we know it's hard to do a self-portrait, but we ask you to help us out. Do a self-portrait. Uh, enjoy your artistic side. And then on the back, we have uh, a question about what it means to you to live in Manitowoc. And what we're looking for is not necessarily the same answer from anybody. Uh, we're looking for diversity. We're looking for people who have good, uh, positive things to say. People who question things about Manitowoc. Make sure that you um, fill out the back do that self-portrait and get it in. Uh, so anyway, long intro, but while we were working on this portrait project in an adjacent room, Diana noticed uh, some, something caught her eye and she decided to uh, take a photograph of uh, some of the silk patterns on the furniture in this room and uh, posted it. And I noticed it. And normally this room is very dark. I don't know, it probably is coming through tonight, that it is a pretty dark room, but for some reason the light was hitting it right, really vivid, bright colors uh, on the, the silk upholstery in this, uh, in this room. And it struck me, boy, I don't know that much about this furniture. And, and those of you who know me know that I, I do have a little bit of furniture background. So I suddenly started to think, oh, I got I to start studying this stuff. I got to figure out a little bit more about this era of furniture and about the people uh, who make it and people who uh, own it. So it was with that that I started to think about what can I do, what can I present to you as a Victorian uh, 
furniture, furnishings, uh, and talk a little bit more about how just how people live. And uh, I hope also as you, we talk about how the RARs lived in this parlor, you think a little bit about what how you live and what furniture choices you've made, what furnishing choices you've made, and how that reflects on you. Um, because one of the uh, one of the things that we we really probably take for granted are the places that we sit, the places that we work, the places that we live, the places that we eat. Those surroundings are with us for oftentimes decades, sometimes through generations. And uh, furniture, furnishings uh, are a connecting point for families, for communities, and really for all of us. So uh, as we go along, if you have a thought about what you're sitting on, or where you're viewing this from, uh, I want you to I want you to take a look at your furniture and think about it. All right. So um, let's talk first of all about uh, Victor the Victorian style and Victorian rooms, um, because the term is really unwieldy. Our mansion uh, uh, here is from the Queen Anne uh, is of the Queen Anne style, uh, late Victorian. Uh, it was designed. Uh, and built in 1891 through 1893. Uh, for our part of the country, uh, that is uh, really the wheelhouse of that late Victorian era. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the furnishings. The, the, the Rar family were not the first people that lived in this house. Joseph and Mary Vilas built the house. Uh, they lived in it from 93 until uh, Mary and then Joseph's death. Uh, in the early 1900s. Uh, I believe Joseph was 1903. And then the house sat empty for many years before the, the, the RARs uh, finally moved in. And uh, I believe, and Diana can correct me, that was 19, about 1909. Uh, so that is when we believe this furniture came into the house. Um, the kind of furniture that we're talking about, though, is uh, the Rococo Revival style. And uh, man, that word is uh, thrown around in a lot of different ways in art, in design, uh, in this case, interior design, and it's the Rococo Revival. Um, I believe the pronunciation of French, uh, Rococo is based off of Rosset, which is a, uh, a French term which means uh, like shell decoration that was used in um, uh, like a, a uh, French um, setting. So uh, it is uh, a kind of in America and certainly Rococo revival, uh, a very broad term to mean uh, things that looked French in the late 19th century. And I must talk about the pronunciation of the word. I can't help myself because I grew up always hearing the word Rococo. And then uh, when I think it was the first time I heard it was when I was in graduate school, people would say Rococo. And I didn't know whether they were um, joking. I think I thought for a long time they were joking. But as it turns out, there are people who pronounce Rococo. I think there might be some other pronunciations, uh, but uh, I'm going to stick with Rococo. One, because that's what I know, and two, because Rococo is wrong. And you can, uh, if you uh, want to disagree with me, you can throw a comment up and say, no, that's how I always pronounced it. Uh, as I understand it, Rococo is uh, a very American way of saying Rococo, but uh, I, I would not be a bad day. My French heritage would be uh, would be insulted if I didn't say uh, Rococo. Now, I, now I'm confused. I can't even say it correct. But that's the style. And uh, interestingly enough, if you look at uh, furniture styles or interior styles in America, uh, most people will talk about Rococo revival being about 1850, uh, maybe uh, charitably 18. Uh, 60, right around the Civil War time. 
And then they they, they kind of end dated in uh, the uh, late 1870s or 1880. Uh, but as I'll hopefully repeat over and over during during this talk, what we think of as far as like linear terms and our thoughts about like design, sometimes you can't be linear about that because one, in different parts of the world and different parts of the country, these types of movements kind of uh, take time to spread out. So what might be like really super the it thing in uh, London or New York or even Chicago in 1880 might not be part of uh, northeastern Wisconsin for another decade or so. Um, and that's just how style kind of dissipates through the through, through the country and, and through the world. So this style uh, oftentimes uh, is considered to predate the Queen Anne Victorian style, but when it comes to a parlor setting, it is uh, no doubt an appropriate style for a parlor and a Victorian parlor. Let's talk a little bit about the Victorian parlor. Um, I might pick up the, 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 uh, the camera and show it to you, and I hope that's not too jarring, but uh, I, I'm gonna do that because there are a few things I wanna highlight and you don't need to be looking at me all this time. So I'm gonna go around and uh, Diana, if I'm not getting this right, you can let me know. Hopefully I won't get too much glare off of our large chandelier. I'll talk about that in a little while. But um, I want to talk a little bit about a, a parlor setting. So you can see uh, the RAR parlor is much like uh, many a Victorian parlor. Uh, has its uh, old um, fireplace, a uh, fire screen, or neat fire screen. Um, and then I'll come around, hopefully not catch too much of the glare from the light. And you'll see uh, tables, uh, a second seating area, very formal. And uh, over here, you might call it a china. I would say this is more of a china than a tajere, though the RARs, I believe, did use it as an tajere. Uh, one quick note about the tajeres. Uh, this was kind of, again, we talk about Rococo being a catch-all term. Uh, in, in this setting, meaning like in this community, in this, uh, this kind of parlor setting, this was a, a status symbol. Uh, the, the parlor itself, the building itself are status symbols, but this idea of an etagere, a cabinet of curiosities, where essentially it gives you an opportunity to showcase all of those, uh, all those trinkets, all those things that are unique that you might've found while traveling, that you might have just because of your wealth, uh, were very, very popular during the Victorian time. And really, no Victorian parlor is complete without its etagere or uh, some sort of cabinet of curiosities. To a, a museum person, the, uh, the, the, the term cabinet of curiosities holds a lot of significance because really that's where the birthplace of, of uh, museums are. You know, this is kind of a forebearer where there are all these exotic things and this is a showcase of all of them. Museums kind of branch out off of this where wealthy people start to build rooms that showcase and they want to explain further and educate people about the different things that they've picked up through the years. So uh, this is kind of a, a small minor forebearer to a museum. And I think it's important to mention that. Uh, the seating, as I mentioned, uh, is all very formal. You know, this is not the type of place where the family is just going to uh, come on a regular night and hang out. This is here essentially for visitors. When visitors would enter our main uh, door uh, our doorway, which was uh, adjacent to this room, uh, they would be seated here for a formal visit. And uh, as you can see, furniture, as I mentioned, uh, is in the Rococo style. Uh, if you've not heard that word and you are sick of me already saying it i want to i do want to highlight a few things about rococo let's go right here to the settee i don't know again that might not be a word that you're normally hearing but a settee 
is effectively, you can think of it as, I'm getting into the, the camera here. Hi. A uh, settee is uh, effectively like what we would think of as a love seat or maybe a sofa. Uh, usually it's going to hold about two people. It's almost like a double wide um, armchair. And very, very popular during this time period. Um, you'll see the, the chairs are wing back. Uh, great chair for a fire because the wing back actually creates uh, naturally a, a little buffer for, from the heat. Um, but also you'll note, and you always note with this style, a ton of carving. Um, you can see, uh, hopefully I'm getting in there. How am I doing, Diana? Yep, we can see it. It looks good. Beautiful. Some rosettes, All right. maybe. So you're seeing a lot of ornate carving work. Uh, rosettes. What's that? I said perhaps they are rosettes. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Well, I was about to say they are rosettes. You'll see a lot of rosette carving in these, these things. You'll see... Um, it's moving on over. Hopefully you're not getting too dizzy, but I have to hit this table up. Um, again, you're going to see a lot of scroll, uh, scroll work. Cabriole legs. Let's bring it back. You see that bended leg? That's a cabriole leg. Um, and moving over to this chair. Oh, I love this. I'm on my, for anybody, who, no, I'm like sitting on the floor. And this, this is a, can you still get that? There you go. So you see a, a little bended leg, the cabriole leg with a, a, a scroll at the bottom. And uh, are you picking up uh, underneath it, these casters? We can oh, see it, yeah. My nails better. So there are casters uh, on, on a lot of the furniture of this era. Uh, I will say as a museum person and any museum people listening know, None of these casters work anymore. They're, they are completely useless, but they were commonplace. Um, I want to note a few things about the carving. One is, uh, though, a spur like this would have been um, rather expensive. Uh, this is not hand carved. And a lot of people mistakenly think that something like this would be hand carved. Uh, in reality, uh, machine carving has existed for centuries. And the idea that something this ornate would have been regularly carved, it, it would be exceptional to have that. And exceptional being uh, so few nationwide that, that they, would, they would really be uh, art pieces much more than they would be something regular for the home. And, uh, you know, the, the hand carving that would be required on something like this is uh, would be astounding. Same with the table. I'll bring it over to the table because that's where you can really see a lot of carving. Um, you know, it's not to say that it isn't possible that you can do this kind of hand carving. As a matter of fact, this is a good time to plug uh, the uh, Manitowoc cabinet, which uh, was hand carved by Manitowoc's own Patrick Burke uh, for the Museum of Wisconsin Art. Uh, an exhibit, including Patrick's work, will be at the RAR West this summer. So if you do want exceptional, ornate, hand-carved work, uh, this summer you can stop by the museum. You'll be able to see it. Uh, but this stuff is machine. Um, let's see if I can get in. Because one of the things uh, when we're looking at all of this ornate stuff is trying to find out who made it. Who's who's responsible for this? So hopefully I can get some some light going here. There we go. Can you see the uh yes, okay. So usually, oh, this is going to be fun now. We get to the underside. Now, furniture, if you ever want to find out, you're looking at antiques. You, you got to always go where you don't normally look. So for chairs, it's the underside. 
If you have anything with drawers, pull those drawers out. Take a look on either the interior of the drawer front or uh, oftentimes on the underside of the drawer. On cabinets like the uh, the china cabinet, the tajere that I showed you, they'll usually be, be on the back, the part that faces the wall. And uh, oftentimes you'll find on tables uh, along the legs. But these are so tight on the legs. And it looks like there has been additional tacked upholstery underneath uh, that there isn't a label. So I've already done you the favor of checking all of these and have discovered we don't have um, any labels on any of these chairs that are part of this set. It would seem like all the chairs are done in mahogany, which was very common for something of the Rococo revival. Uh, you know, rosewood was used often, but uh, this one in particular, I believe to be, uh, I believe to be in mahogany. Uh, and you'll also note, let's see if I can get a good look at this seam right here. As I, as I pass my light over it, you'll see there's a line. That's a connecting point. These legs, again, being that they were machine carved, would all be machine carved separate from the chair and then attached, usually through uh, glue um, and some sort of a joint to the rest of the chair. So uh, again, take a look at the furniture. If you have some, uh, you know, decades old furniture or definitely hand-me-downs, things that might have come from a grandparent or uh, a, a parent uh, that would be, you know, somewhat from this era, whether they're about 100 years old or, or more, uh, you'll be able to see these. And oftentimes this time of year, you might get a little separation in there because, uh, you know, the wood shrinks during the during the wintertime uh, as it dries out. And it, it'll give you a better idea of how it was actually originally originally built. This is also a good opportunity to see some of the stitching and the upholstery, which was the original uh, my original motivation. Diana, can you see the upholstery? OK. I can see it. You should show them the back of the settee and put I the know, light on it because that must have been uh, up against a wall. I'll move this. Mm -hmm. And can I know I, I've got a light. Hopefully you're not getting too much glare from the light. Yeah, you can see all the colors. They really do pop. And uh, again, this combination, you could see the wood grain up here, mahogany. And then uh, this would be silk um silk damask uh a lot of uh people don't know this but by the by the 1890s there were uh synthetic fabrics that were produced that mimicked silk um but this in particular seems to be in in my estimation just based on the variables in the stitching to be um done in silk so you've you've got a little bit of background on the furniture, the furniture style, but we still don't know where this came from. Well, again, taking a look around, we've looked at a few of the chairs, the, the uh, upholstered pieces, but I want to come over here to a table that is not a match. And again, hopefully you can see when I point to the to the feet, you'll see they're both scrolled feet, but a different style of scroll foot. Cabriole leg. So it's the same style, but it's not identical. It would not necessarily be part of a matching set. Oh, now I'm getting... For anybody who doesn't know, I am now laying down on my back in my museum. Uh -oh. And look at that. I think... Can you see that, Diana? Yes, I can see it. And I'm also thoroughly enjoying this. Oh, I'm glad. So uh, we found a label, which is excellent. <laughs> uh, this is the Ketchum and Rothschild Furniture Company out of Chicago. And Ketchum and Rothschild were, uh, let's see, I believe they started around the uh, post-Civil uh, War. And they, they had a, a company... In Chicago, and, and their, their headquarters were right in downtown Chicago. 
Uh, so we're talking about, I'm going to, I'm going to put this back up and let the blood rush back to my head. Uh, they had a place in downtown Chicago, like, uh, I think it was East Van Buren, which is right around the corner from the art Institute of Chicago for any, uh, art enthusiasts. Uh, and the, uh, you know, that's, that's not far from the lake. I'm talking about the heart of downtown. Uh, they started to make furniture around 1870 and they actually, they continued to manufacture furniture, um, up until, uh, 1940 or so. And some of their, uh, art nouveau, or not art nouveau, art deco furniture from the 1920s, 30s, and, and up to 1940 are, are known, but they also, uh, had a sizable upholstered furniture division. So, uh, it was probably hard for you to follow, but I was underneath the, well, you probably can't even see it the table behind me, but the furniture that, that I've showed you, the uh, upholstered furniture, the armchairs, the settee, those uh, conceivably could have also come from Ketchum and Rothschild. Uh, they definitely made furniture of that style. Uh, it's important to note, uh, even if it didn't come from Ketchum and Rothschild, that this furniture most likely came for, out of Chicago. And it probably came out of Chicago sometime in the 1890s or that first uh, decade of the 1900s. Um, that would coincide with Chicago really raising its profile as a furniture making city. And furniture making has uh, gone through a lot of different iterations in America. Uh, but post uh, Civil War, you start to see a lot more Midwest. And for Chicago, uh, this period of the 1890s is huge. As many of you probably know, 1893 was the Chicago World's Fair uh, called the Columbian Exposition. Uh, that would have taken place only a few blocks from where Ketchum and Rothschild uh, were, were uh, headquartered. And uh, it should be noted that this style wouldn't really have gone with the style of the Columbian Ex uh, Exposition. Uh, World's fairs usually are very forward looking and Rococo Revival would have been at its, uh, uh, it would have been beyond its high point and, and working its way out of public conscience by then. As really were Victorians, Victorian houses and a Victorian parlor like this. So uh, again, I return to the idea of what is in fashion at the, you know, World's Fair in 1893 is not what's in fashion uh, two and a half hours north in Manitowoc, Wisconsin in 1893 when this building was completed. Um, but 1890s not only was the time of the Chicago World's Fair, the Chicago uh, furniture market developed in uh, the 1890s. And so not only uh, Ketchum and Rothschild, but many other furniture companies started, not only they had already been producers, but there were enough of them and they were popular enough nationwide that they created what's called a furniture market, which is where it's essentially a major nationwide trade show for furniture manufacturers, not only in Chicago, but from all over the Midwest, and in fact, all over the United States, to bring their furniture and showcase the new things that they were creating. Uh, so that happens in the 1890s. During that period, maybe they're bringing some of this Rococo revival, some of this kind of Victorian style, but really by the 1900s, the Victorian style was becoming a lot less popular. Uh, and that's where, for those of you who know, uh, who knew me before I was at the Rar West, uh, or have seen uh, some of my other talks, you'll know that that's when the arts and crafts movement comes into its ascendancy. Uh, I'm going to jar the camera again because I need to showcase a few things to talk about why Victorian stopped being. Okay. 
let's go back to the rosette because I think this is uh, something that we have to talk about. So, uh, do, 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 do. <laughs> okay, you see a little bit of the carving here? Yes. One of the things you'll also notice on the carving is a bunch of dust. And if you look at the, the you know, just the, the uh, amount of carved things, ornate things, uh, upholstered things around this room, uh, one, of, one of the reasons, a, a very practical reason why the Victorian movement started to slow down is a, a rise in the knowledge of uh, communicable diseases. Uh, it's, it's the time of influenza. And during the 1890s, uh, 1880s and 1890s, uh, science starts to recognize that disease, not really sure what it was, but they knew some sort of uh, bacteria or something could uh, be spread through contact, that it could be left somewhere. So creating antiseptic areas became really a necessity. And so things that were ornately carved start to give way to things like, for anybody who's heard my stickly talk, uh, you know, things that are very straight lined, not only from an aesthetic standpoint, but from a practical standpoint, things that are much, much easier to clean. Uh, and that's a necessity. And I thought, hey, you know, in this time, we probably want to revisit some of the practical considerations that lead to changes in styles. And that's a big one. So uh, during the Victorian uh, era, this was a super popular style. And as I've said, for many, many reasons, uh, it starts to peter out uh, in the early 1900s. Well, that leaves us with a question. And that is, uh, did the RARs buy this furniture when they moved in? Or did they have this furniture before they moved in? Because like I said, they didn't get here until about 1809. And that would have been obviously well beyond when the Rococo era uh, had kind of fallen out of favor. Um, and it would have been a time when, when arts and crafts was starting to really gain popularity. Maybe I'll just gonna say hi to the, this is the, actually the Rar family. And this is this picture, I believe, was taken right around the time where they did move into the house. Uh, so, again, the question remains: This furniture, uh, from what I can tell and what I research, uh, looks like it probably would have been sold sometime around 1900. So, uh, I would guess, unless the Rars particularly wanted to fill this room as a Victorian parlor and, and sought out distinctively this Rococo Revival furniture, that this stuff probably would have been bought prior to them living here and they would have, they would have brought it here and, and, and felt like uh, this would be the good place for it. Uh, I will say the furniture, the uh, upholstered furniture, uh, seems to be a matching set, the matching upholstered furniture. But the tables that you see around this room and uh, the etagere are not matching. So as with hopefully your home, you recognize that you don't just move into a house and buy all new furniture that matches the rooms. Uh, oftentimes furniture carries with it meaning uh, and if not meaning, practicality. That you don't just match every room stylistically uh, with, uh, with the style of architecture that it's in. And you also don't necessarily match the, uh, every piece of furniture, you know? Uh, I think oftentimes when we look at historic homes, if they don't have the original furniture, they sometimes get furnished with everything coming from one era and everything matches. And that really doesn't tell the truth of how people 
lived and how people live. Uh, and that's one of the great benefits, one of the great gifts that we have in having this room uh, furnished with its orig original furniture. It tells a much more nuanced story, uh, and it tells a little bit more of the truth of the people that lived here. Uh, again, if you have any questions about the RARs, if you have any questions, uh, you, you saw something as I was panning through here and you want to learn more about a piece of furniture or uh, about a specific detail on a piece of furniture, leave a comment uh, and we'll try to get back to you on that. Uh, there was one other piece. I don't know what our time is because uh, I haven't really looked. Oh, wait, I've got a clock. Um, but I did want to talk about this clock. I might have to back up. Even uh, it's 537, Greg. Ah, uh, perfect. Yes, that. Okay, so I want to talk about this big clock, which is not a grandfather clock, even though when you start to look at it, you think it might be. Um, this clock was not original to the house. And this clock was not part of the RARS um, furnishings when they lived in the house. Am I, am I losing it? No, I got it. Sorry. Uh, wanted to get a different angle, and it's kind of hard to see. Uh, this clock actually never resided in this building when the RARs lived here, though it was owned by Guido Rar, the son in the family. Uh, this clock, it's a, a Westport, uh, I'm sorry, not Westport, Waterbury, Waterbury Clock Company. It's called the Regulator Number 7, and this is a production clock. This isn't a custom-made again. I want to stress, these are not hand-carved items. These things are machined, uh, but uh, they are rather ornate. Uh, and this would have been for uh, Waterbury Clock Company, one of their most ornate. It, uh, it first got made in 1891. So again, it's right in the same time period as what you see uh, in the rest of the Victorian man uh, parlor. But you can see that the style is, is different. Uh, fluted, uh, fluted carvings on the sides, uh, not really a um, uh, Rococo uh, style. And this oak piece would have been in uh, Guido Rar's factory. Now the Rar family were brewers and uh, in the brewery, this clock resided uh, up until the brewery was sold to Anheuser-Busch. And of course, it's now Brees Malting here in Manitowoc. Um, but when we heard about this clock, there's one really interesting story. Um, the woman that donated this clock to the RAR West, her name uh, was uh, Annette Young. And she had worked for the RARs and her husband worked for the RARs. Uh, her husband was Woody Young. And Woody and Arlette uh, were befriended by Guido Rar and his family. And uh, Guido left this clock to Arlette and, uh, and Woody upon his death. And so this went from not the Rar home, which we're sitting in, but the Rar, uh, Rar Brewing Company to this family, the Young family, and then here to the RAR West in uh, 2017. And we thought, hey, this is a good match. Uh, not only is it a good match because we have re-included it with some of the other furnishings from uh, the RAR family, but, and I hate to do this to you, but I do have to, oh, I don't think I'm gonna be able to get a good look at it. But that huge light that you see, oh, you know what, I'll turn it off. And then you can see it. Uh, let's see. Can you get a look at it now, or is it too dark? No, it's pretty dark. Dang it. Well, now you're just going to have to come to the Rar West. You'll find uh, above us is a an ornate crystal chandelier, and the chandelier is um, is also uh, an item that didn't come from the house but did come from the RAR family and the RAR Brewing Company. It was the original um, chandelier from the tasting room at the RAR Brewing Company. So uh, 
when Mrs. Young offered us the clock, we thought, what better way than to pair these two things from the brewing company in this same room that the RARs uh, had used as their parlor. And that gives you a big snapshot of everything in here. Uh, once again, if you have any more questions, you can uh, hit us up. Yeah, we do have a question. Um, I just want to add that the original light fixture is still in the house. It's on the landing of the second floor. So if you do come visit, you'll be able to see the light fixture that was in the space during the, the RARs when they lived there. Yeah, um, that's, that's an excellent point. And, uh, but I do want to note that I hope what I explained gives you an idea that when you come into a museum and you see a room like this, there's more to it than uh, what, what first meets the eye. Uh, that there are some, in this room, some things that catch your eye, which it's important to note did not actually come from this place. It's important to note that this furniture wasn't in this place for the first 20 years it was a home. Um, and we hope that when you visit the Rar West or any historic site, that you do take uh, some care to, to uh, read the labels and find out a little bit more and find out a little bit deeper uh, what's going on in the museum. Because we try to express the truth, but sometimes it's a complicated truth. Yeah. Um, I also hope that with this, you are looking at your own home in a different way and thinking about what it says about you. And uh, with that, I also want to invite you to come back to the RAR West because we are reopening beginning on Friday. Uh, we will be reinstituting the art path to allow for safe, distanced enjoyment of our art collection. We have a lot of our permanent collection up in this Vilas RAR mansion. And uh, Diana has also uh, put together a selection of new acquisitions uh, in our galleries. So you can take a look at that. We also have a very special exhibit that will be opening beginning of March. It's being created and curated by the Friends of the Rar West Art Museum. It is for the love of eggs and it's all art based on the egg. So I hope that you enjoyed this. Uh, again, if you have questions, come to the Rar West. We love to answer them. And now that we're open, it's going to be great to see you again. Thanks for tuning in. And uh, we'll be doing some more of these in the future. Uh, even when we're open to the public, we want to use virtual as much as we can so we can reach out to those of you who might not be in the area, those of you who might not be able to come back and join us right now. So we look forward to seeing you again. Thanks, Diana, for setting this up. Thanks for letting me jump on in and roll around on the floor of the RAR parlor. And uh, we'll see you again real soon. Thank you, Greg.